We've got games in the books to talk about. Episode two of the Gower Hour in full swing. I'm Rob Joyce. She is Megan Gower of her hoop stats. The opening week of college basketball has been okay. A couple of entertaining games on Monday in Paris. That was really about it until last night. Uh, admittedly, the schedule this week wasn't the best. A couple of good games this weekend. We'll talk about South Carolina, NC State. We'll talk about Duke and Maryland next week. Largely brutal once you get past the weekend before we talk again next Friday. But Megan, we got to start. Biggest game of the week, Nashville. You were <laughs> in the building for one of the first games of the year on Monday. Memorial, historic Memorial Gymnasium. Vandy Lipscomb. Give me a rundown. Well, I don't think we need to spend a lot of time on Lipscomb because I don't think they will be. Someone will be talking about in March much. No offense to them. But Vandy looked good. Um, their freshman, top 10 freshman, huge recruit for, for Shay Rolf there. Had a, a really solid first outing for them. Um, I think she had like, yeah, 23 points. Um, and I thought she looked really good. Camille Pierre as well looked really good for them. I don't know. It felt like they had something with those two there. So not saying they're going to be, you know, a, a second weekend team or anything, but this is a team I think could win an NCAA tournament game this year, maybe. I mean, that's the progression, right? Like right. Shay Ralph took over a bad Vanderbilt team, one of the worst in the SEC. Decent year one. Last year made playing game. They go to the playing game or they make the field outright. Regardless, they yeah. were they made the tournament. Yeah. Now winning a game, moving on. Lipscomb, when they win the A Sun, I'm gonna come back to this in March. <laughs> uh, how else was Nashville? Like, were you strolling down Broadway in a pink cowgirl hat and you know sipping yeah. drinks, wearing boots? <laughs> I do. I do have boots. I did not wear a pink cowgirl hat. It was good. It was good little little break from the day job. So it's good. And then you saw two games this week, right? Because you were yep. in the you're in the building last night for UConn and BU, and that's the extent we'll talk about. <laughs> on BU because yeah, not much to say there not a very no. close game <laughs> no uh over overall takeaways from week one don't overreact to anything it's game one most teams like UConn like Vanderbilt didn't really play anyone don't get me wrong if your favorite team had a home by game and one by 40 50 30 that's a good thing you're probably supposed to right. just I'm not going to completely change my view on a team one way or the other you know did, did Vanderbilt am I going to crown them as a Final Four team because they beat the heck out of Lipscomb. No. UConn showed good things against BU. Those are just, you know, the two examples. Maryland showed some nice things against Coppin State. I'm not taking a whole lot from any of those games or any of these, these bye games. Last or That said, though, last year we didn't talk about NC State in the preseason preview. Last week, you know who we didn't talk about? Michigan. Michigan. <laughs> in a loss. Still, won't be the last time we bring up the Wolverines. Yeah, I think obviously they're the biggest surprise probably of week one here in that they definitely gave South Carolina a bit of a run for their money on um, opening day in Vegas and largely credit to their top 10 recruit, Swords, um, freshman, 27 points in her first game, 12 rebounds, just incredible performance from her. 27 points. Yeah, uh, if, if you missed it over on the... Other part of the Here Hoop Stats feed, the Coast to Coast gang. Uh, Karina was in Ann Arbor what, two weeks ago and yeah. talked to Silas Swords, Canadian on Canadian action. Um, and the Wolverines, you know, I, I asked someone around the program last week, like, what's what, what are kind of the vibes? Because Michigan just kind of hanging around in the middle. We didn't talk about them last week. No one really expected them to do a whole lot. I wouldn't say people were expecting them to miss the tournament, but you know, they're just kind of hanging out. And then quarter one, half one. Suddenly, this is a team that, you know, I know they're 0-1. They could be ranked next week. Yeah. <laughs> the easiest path to ranking with a loss is to keep it close with South Carolina. And they, they certainly did that. <laughs> yes. Uh, so now, suddenly, those expectations change. They're relying on freshmen. So you're going to have probably freshman moments going forward. So I'm not going to vault Michigan as a, you know, a second weekend team. But all of a sudden, those expectations go from, we're not talking about them when we talk about 33 teams last week to now they're right in that conversation in the middle of the pack in the big 10, maybe that upper echelon. We talked last week, it's seemingly two teams at the top and then kind of a mishmash of teams, three, maybe four through what? 10, 11, 12. There's a lot of teams in the big 10 now, uh, South Carolina side, you know, I had a whole thing written down as the game is going on and all of it kind of gets thrown out the window now because Ashlyn Watkins will eventually be back. Um, biggest takeaway was the Gamecocks looked mortal in the paint 
intimidating, still as tough as anyone nationally, but they didn't look like some impenetrable force. And now that changes because they're going to get Ashton Watkins back eventually. Yeah, that that's going to be big for them. I think having uh, someone with some veteran experience in the post, because that was the most evident thing in this game was that they, they didn't look as dominant as they usually look in the lane. I also think some things happen in this game that just like aren't going to happen regularly. Raven Johnson is probably not going to be 0 for 8 for the floor on the normal basis. Like they didn't shoot the ball well. Their guards had a bit of a rough night too. So I, I don't take too much out of this one for the Gamecocks. They're going to get Watkins back and they'll figure out some of those things that are probably largely just choked up to first day out. I mean, that's the recipe though, right? Like part of it yeah. is you need to play extremely well. You also need South Carolina to play a C plus game, right? Probably at best because they're just they're so good that you need them to shoot five of twenty six from three. If they're going to shoot even ten of twenty six from three, like good night, yeah. game's over. <laughs> the Watkins thing. The Chargers were dismissed if you missed it after she completed or has to complete pre trial intervention, so she's back to practice. This is a hard situation. I think I kind of play in the middle. If you're on one extreme. You know, the legal system played out. It is well within her rights. She is fully entitled to rejoin the team. Does it feel fully right? Like, I don't know when she's going to play. It's it's difficult because clearly she did some sort of wrongdoing. If you're in the boat of, you know, she doesn't deserve the privilege of being a basketball player, et cetera, et cetera. Like, you're not wrong. If the legal system played out. You're not wrong. I feel like it's somewhere in the middle of it doesn't feel fully great all around but she makes south carolina the overwhelming favorite and you know if if you're like don't be naive she's one of the 10 best basketball players in the country she's she's the best defensive player in the country if she's the 12th person on the roster this is probably a different conversation and i'm not blaming don staley one way or the other i'm sure that watkins is getting her punishment within the program end of the day she will be there in march and april and i basically throw out monday out the window because South Carolina is going to be darn near impossible when she's on the floor to score inside. Yeah, exactly. Um, and it's hard to comment on. Obviously neither of us know the details of what happened. So just, I agree with you I'm somewhere in the middle, but it is going to be a difference maker for this team to have her back. And from a basketball perspective, like this is huge from, from a South Carolina perspective. And like you said, this game without her really means nothing. Cause this is an entirely different team with her on the floor. I mean, we still did see the unmatched depth. Don Staley doesn't change her starting lineups, generally. Bree Hall still started. Malaysia Full-Wiley still came off the bench, just like last year. I would expect Snia Fagan will eventually go to the bench whenever Watkins comes back. Uh, so she will come off the bench. Joyce Edwards, I thought, looked really good in her first game. Look around. UConn, UCLA, USC, they just don't... They have some depth. They don't have that level of talent of depth texas a little bit but not as much notre dame doesn't like all these teams your eight your seven have to beat south carolina's what 10 yeah and over the course of a season like sure you might get them in november or even on you know one off night but over the course of 30 some odd games if south carolina has eight players playing 15 to 20 minutes a night and usc has Seven players playing 30 minutes a night. Like those those minutes just, just add up. Uh, other takeaways from Monday. The two Paris games were really good. We'll start with the early one. USC outlasts Ole Miss. Uh, that, I was low on Ole Miss last week. My expectations for them have changed. Again, I don't want to overreact too much to one game, but my expectations for them went up. Yeah, I think if they can keep getting scoring like they get did against USC, that's going to be huge for them. KKD has had a big night, 19 points. They got 14 from Madison Scott. If they can keep getting that, I think this team is much different. I think when we talked about them last week, we're like, the defense is always so solid, but you, you got to score the basketball. And we haven't seen this team be able to consistently do that. So one game doesn't make a consistent thing, but it's worth keeping an eye on them for sure because if they can keep getting those, they didn't have KKD's most of the season last year, but she was a big scorer when she was at West Virginia, when she was at Florida. So if, if that's something they can keep getting, I think that changes the outlook for this team. It's, it's a willingness to shoot the three that got me. They averaged 11 attempts last year. Well, they had 11 by halftime on Monday and I I don't expect them to become a team that just shoots, you know, chucks up 30 a game, but 
they don't need to be with the way that their defense plays. Uh, last year, they made six threes in a game three whole times against the, the mighty powers of Queens, Temple, and Southern Miss. Well, they made seven against seven or eight against USC. Just need to make probably a couple more of them. But you know, the if you're looking for an overreaction hot take, South Carolina, Texas, LSU, Ole Miss, probably is is your quote unquote hot take takeaway if you're looking for one. Yeah. Yeah, I still need to see it a couple times, right? It's just one game, but I, I agree. I, I do. Hot takes, Megan. Hot, Hot takes. takes. Sorry. <laughs> what we're here for. Uh, USC side, what, what, what do you take away? Uh, they look like a team that's really young, which is what they are. Um, I mean, Juju was great. Obviously, that was the difference maker. Kiki Ariafin was great. Everyone else, it's going to take see a she minute. changed. Well, we apparently had been saying her name wrong, according to Ryan Rucco and Rebecca Lobo. Ariafin. Oh god, that's gonna take me a minute. <laughs> yes, you were you were in Nashville. You were watching different basketball. Yeah, they, they, they had a whole thing about it. Yeah, Iria Fenn. Iria but Fenn. Uh, okay. yeah, it looked like a team that just it needs time to gel. Yeah, right. Like they have all the talent in the world. Now it's just a matter of Lindsay Gottlieb trying to put it together. I will say, Juju, the one place that she needs to improve on just be more efficient. Yeah. Go back to last year. Now, eleven straight games she shot below fifty percent. She's shot below 40% in seven of those 11 games. Uh, 19 games since the end of last January. She has six or more turnovers, seven of those 19 games. She had nine turnovers on Monday. Just all the talent in the world. 1A or 1B, most talented player in the country. That's just the, the one spot that she needs to clean up. Yeah, and I think that'll come slowly throughout the season. I mean, last year she was a freshman. There's a, That's the big excuse for a lot of that stuff. Now, as a sophomore, yeah, you expect her to clean some of that up, but we're still in the end of November. I'm not worried that she won't. If you're looking for your USC overreaction, uh, your hot take, they won the game, unlike LSU last year, who got drubbed by Colorado <laughs> in the opener. But the Trojans, I said last week, like the floor in LSU type season, where it's all the talent, big waves in the portal, high recruiting or big time freshmen coming in, and it just. It never fully clicks, and you wind up uh, terrible in the Elite Eight, right? Uh, so that's your, you know, USC overreaction. But they ultimately win their 1-0, 68-66, make the defensive stop in the final seconds. Leads us to game two out in Paris. UCLA, Louisville, Bruins warm down eventually in the fourth and ultimately pull away. Good showing, though, from uh, from Louisville. Yeah, good showing from Louisville. I think I was impressed that they hung around, but... I feel like similar to we just talked about throwing out South Carolina's game one, and I kind of would do that with UCLA here too because no Kiki Rice is obviously a big loss for them, and I think they're saying she's just day-to-day -day with a shoulder injury, so hopefully they'll have her back soon, but I think it's hard to take too much away from this UCLA team without the point guard. I will say, yeah, they only played seven players, so they'll play eight in their rotation. I guess nine if you include the, I think, seven minutes Kendall Dudley played, but not sure if Gabriela Hawkes will move into the starting lineup permanently. Someone has to come out when Kiki Rice comes back. But I thought Tamia Gardner is perfect for this instant offense in a way that I don't know if they had off the bench last year. Come in from Oregon State, her job, instant offense. She made five threes off the bench. She's not going to do that every game, of course. But that's the kind of difference maker that can push you over the edge from a Sweet 16 and Elite 8 into a Final Four, Just getting points somewhere else for a team that isn't always the most efficient scoring. Yeah, exactly. And then remember that this team is going to get Charlize Ledger Walker at some point, too, when she's healthy. So um, that will get them someone else That's going to the bench or her off the bench as well. So I do, I do think, yeah, they've got the right pieces there to have more offense when they've they've struggled offensively in the past. But hard to take much, I think, away from this first game without Rice out there. I will say, Lauren Betts, she is an efficient scorer. Uh, led the team in assists. She has yeah. five assists. If she can become a good passing big, ooh. That's that's enticing. Yeah, it's enticing and also great for her at the next level. I feel like it's not a skill we see a ton of in college. We see a handful of players that are, are really good passing bigs, but it's not not a there's a few and far between type of thing that you see in college. So huge for her if she could add that to her game. Uh yeah, Stephanie Dolson's the one that pops up off the top of my head. I'm sure there are others that she's the first one that, that came to mind. She was also graduated probably 10 years ago at this point. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Louisville side, I'm excited about the Cardinals' future. It might not be this year where they're a you know top 15 team. I don't think they're that far off. Tajiana Roberts played really well. They hung around even with Olivia Cochran in foul trouble for a lot of the game. 
a tough shooting nights for some of the younger folks, but they were energetic, I thought, like McKinley Randolph, Amari Berry. Like, I see the talent there. Now it just might take a year for it to fully blossom into top of the ACC type team. Yeah, I agree. I think this is a team that's it's young. It's probably going to have its up and downs this season. But, I mean, I still think they're going to be someone, as Jeff Walls' teams always are, to keep an eye on when we get late in the season. And then, yeah, next year, there, there's a lot of talent here. And I think this is a promising showing from what was kind of a pretty big question mark entering the season. Uh, quick bits and bobs I noticed from Monday. Olivia Miles, welcome back. Again, they blew out. I don't even remember who they played. They blew off the doors off of... <laughs> whoever but she played triple double looks the part yeah I, I think that's great for Notre Dame to see that's what you want it's been a long time since she's played a college basketball game to so, so to see her come out regardless if you're playing and play at that level is is really exciting uh Oklahoma I like that they did what you're supposed to do or what you should do in these early season games they could have gone out and scored a billion points and play the way Oklahoma typically does. I like that they tried to pound the ball inside to Reagan Beers. We talked last week. Can they win different ways? I thought that was a nice uh, just see that it works. Obviously, Reagan Beers is all the talent in the world. Uh, Duquesne over Princeton, not the last Ivy League team we'll talk about, but the Tigers, any at-large hopes? Like You have to complete, you probably have to beat the likes of DePaul, Villanova, Seton Hall, Utah, MTSU. Does it matter? Is it toast? Let's, loss let's talk about that. Oh, for Princeton. Sorry, I thought you were talking about Duquesne. I was going to say we can talk no. about the A10 some later because I have an A10 hot take. But um, Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> no, I mean, I don't think it's totally lost for Princeton. I think the top of the Ivy is going to be pretty good like it always is. So, yeah, they gotta they got to make up for it with some of these other non-conference games. But it's, it's not totally lost for them. Which takes us to there was nothing happening on Tuesday that interested, at least yeah. me. Wednesday, nothing. Shout out to Iowa, though. I challenged Iowa at the end of last year, like, come back. Caitlin Clark's gone. Prove that you are basketball fans, not Caitlin Clark fans. They packed the place for a Wednesday night on Big Ten Plus against NIU. Shout out to the Hawkeyes, because I have a hottish take about them later. So you have your A-10, I have my Iowa one. <laughs> uh, Thursday... More interesting than I thought it would be. And we'll start, we'll stay in the Ivy League. How about the Crimson going to Bloomington, knocking off the Hoosiers? Yeah, this is a fun game. I watched most of the second half while at the UConn game because that one was over after the first quarter. Um, but yeah, great win for, for Harvard. I mean, like I'm not totally shocked by it. You bring back a couple of veteran players, Indiana, they're probably a fringe top 25 team. Like, yes, they're in the top 25 right now. I think everyone knows they're going to struggle some after what they've lost over the last couple of years. But huge win for Harvard. Harmony Turner was fantastic. She's been really good for them for the last three years. But great start to her senior season, 24 points, and they, they knock them off. It was it was a fun game. Overtime, I don't know if it was our first overtime of the season. First overtime of the season that I watched, at least. Yeah, 27 turnovers for Indiana. Yeah. Uh, they're just, we talked about it last week. I don't know where the instant offense, like they don't have that superstar player. If Yard and Garzon goes five of 12, like she's going to have those nights, but Sydney Parrish can't go one of seven if Garzon goes five of 12 or vice versa. Uh, Lily Meester had a nice night, 20 and 15. Maybe she's, you know, I guess she's the de facto replacement for Mackenzie Holmes. That Those are big shoes to fill consistently. Indiana, I think, I don't know, we, we put them last week in like that 8-9 seed range. That's probably still yeah. where they are. Like, Again, don't overreact to one loss to a good Harvard team early in the season. We've seen we've seen better teams come back from worse losses. I think Oklahoma last year was a 5 seed. They lost to Southern in like December. So, you know, season's not over. Um, any other takeaways from Thursday? Oh, Florida State, Illinois. Te technically our first quote-unquote or second behind Harvard, Indiana, quote-unquote, unranked upset. I don't really call this an upset. Yeah, I feel like the Harvard one felt more like an upset because I don't think Harvard was a team that was on many people's radar. Illinois is probably, what, first, second, and getting votes outside yeah. of the top 25. Like, we know they're a fringe top 25 team, very similar category to Florida State, I would say, probably fringe top 25 team for, for the season. I don't know. This one doesn't do a whole lot for me. It's, like, good win for Illinois. Florida State, as we said, I think last week is just so volatile. Like when they shoot the ball well, they're gonna run up the score, and if you can't keep up with them, they're gonna win. If they don't shoot the ball well, last night happens. Like it's just 
it is what it is. Yeah, when they shoot five of twenty-one from three, like they did last night, they just they don't have the defense to right. overcome it. Illinois scored twenty points or more in every quarter. That's yep, <laughs> that's hard to do. It makes for again, it makes for entertaining basketball if, right. if if they're on and they can beat pretty much anyone if they're on. They can almost also lose to a lot more teams than most top twenty-five teams if yep. the shot's not falling. So good win for Illinois, who didn't really have. They beat Indiana in February last year. I think they beat the brains out of them at their place. Yeah. But by that point, I think it was too close to the end of the year. Like th their resume had largely already been written. So an early season win that'll go down as a ranked win. We'll see how it ages over the course of the year. But that's what Illinois lacked from early on last year. So a good start for the Illini. Um, I don't really have any other takeaways from the week. Again, it's exciting. The season's here. That's awesome. We have games to talk about. A lot of buy games. So, yeah. so we can, you know, some bits and bobs that we missed last week um, that I wanted to ask you about. But we just ran out of time. We'll start. Give me a team that can have an NC State type of year. And I'm not saying they need to go from off the radar to the final four, but a team we already have probably one of the teams that you might mention we talked about already that is off the radar that lives in the top 25 most of the year could be a second weekend team, if not more. I think the one you're alluding to is obviously Michigan after what we saw yes. against South Carolina. I mean, obviously I need to see it more than one game. One game doesn't tell a story, but I, I do think there's someone to keep an eye on. Clearly they've got a lot of talent there. So excited to see what they do. TCU is another one for me. I forget who they played this week. No, so no one notable, but really good game from Sedona Prince, really good game from Haley Van Lith. Like the talent is there. If they can keep it together, the talent is there, and I think a team that could be better than people expect. Show some swag that that Haley Vanlith swagger. Where she, yeah. I think she had six steals. She hit twenty some odd points. That's an interesting one to pay attention to in a league that is more open than most. TCU, uh, yeah, team. I think I think you're probably right. That is probably better than I, I would put them in the preseason. My team is Iowa. They're not that much different than last year. Obviously they don't have the national player of the year in Caitlin Clark. They don't have a generational talent like Caitlin Clark, but they can still score the heck out of the ball. Lucy Olson is going to average 20 some odd points a game, probably this year. They had all five and double figures. Again, it was Northern Illinois. Take that as you will. But Hannah Stolke, if she can continue to grow from her freshman to her sophomore to now her junior year, they have others who are capable of scoring. They just didn't have the ball in their hands quite as much last year with Caitlin Clark. They still can't really defend. And without a superhero on the other ends, that will hurt them more than it did last year. But right now they're living outside the top 25. I think they'll live in the top 20 most of the year. I think they'll finish top five in the Big Ten. And I wouldn't be surprised if they made a run to the second weekend this year. So that's my team, which... If you had told me that two years ago, you know, we were the big Iowa haters two years ago. You were the big Iowa hater last year. And well, Lovely here we are. <laughs> here we are. Uh, other end of that. Every year, it seems there's a preseason top 25 team that misses the tournament. Last year, it was Illinois, Washington State. A little bit of an asterisk. Their best player tore ACL. Mississippi State. Year before, Oregon, Nebraska. Three years ago, Texas A&M, West Virginia. Who in the preseason top 25? either is very, very bubbly or misses the field. I have two. Yeah, I think one for me is Indiana after last night. I think, I don't know, like they they probably make it, but I think there's going to be a lot of ups and downs with this team. I think I know, might know what one of your other one is, but Creighton I think is going to have a harder time than usual because the Big East is not great this year. Bad. <laughs> yeah. uh, Creighton is one of them. We'll save them for for a second. My other one's Alabama. If they go winless in their five big games and their, their schedule, it's a little weird. They don't play anybody, and then it's a gauntlet for two weeks. And then they don't really play anybody, and then they close with a brutal schedule. Let me pull it up real quick. They play nobody in the non-con. Their best non-conference game is at Cal. Yeah. Home to Michigan State is okay. That's not great. And then in January, they go at Texas – at Ole Miss, home to South Carolina. Brutal. They close the year, home to LSU, at Oklahoma. So they just have these little pockets where it's incredibly tough. If they go 0-5 in, 
in those games, that puts a lot of pressure on you to not trip up elsewhere. Don't lose to Missouri or Arkansas or Florida or Georgia. You have to beat your Michigan States, your Vanderbilts, your Kentuckys, your Mississippi States, teams that are vying in that, what, they're 30 some on at-larges, like at-large teams 26 through the WNIT or WBIT, whichever one they go to. So that just puts a lot of pressure on it. And so I'll say them. And now let's talk Blue Jays because they're they're really the, the team to watch over the next week when yeah. the schedule Sunday's decent. The schedule largely this Friday to next weekend sucks. Yeah. Put it bluntly. <laughs> Creighton is the exception. Creighton opens their season tonight, Friday, at South Dakota State. What are they doing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a tough way to open your schedule. Um, sorry, a little bit of a cold. Um, but yeah, a tough way to – South Dakota State won, always a hard place to play. They're always really good. This team is experienced. Like, I think they're a team that's a mid-major that's going to make some noise this year. That's a, a really tough way to open your schedule. I don't really quite get why they didn't try to schedule something easier on, like, Monday before that game. Well, they have South Dakota State tonight, 27-6 and six last year, Summit League champs. Then they host Drake, 29 wins last year, Missouri Valley champs right on. There were a team that – they won the NBC, so it didn't matter, but they were flirting with at-large yeah. territory. They go to Kansas State, and then they host Nebraska. So let's assume they go 0-3 against UCLA in the two times they play UConn. Will we know by next week if they're an at-large team or not? I think no, because if they win, like, every other game, they might be able to sneak in, depending what happens. But, but like, what's the difference between if, if Creighton is 23? three and six or 24 and six, but they didn't beat anybody versus pick a mid-major team yeah. that, you know, pick Drake that wouldn't be an at-large because they don't play anyone. Like what's the difference? Yeah, it's, it's fair. Um, I don't know. It's like expecting that someone in the Big East is going to do something, but that's a, a large expectation for this year. It feels, um, yeah. I mean, I think they have to win at least one of the South Dakota state, Drake games. I think you can't lose both of those. You could probably lose the K-State game if you win both, but yeah, you, you got to pick up some wins in the stretch. So two and two at minimum. Yeah. Between South Dakota State, Drake, K-State, and Nebraska. That seems fair. Yeah. They do have nearly everyone back. They lost Emma Ronchick. She's at Colorado State, but Lauren Jensen, Morgan Molly, Molly Mogensen, and they're even playing UConn at the men's arena. Congratulations for treating your <laughs> women's team like a real yeah. program. They only made the Elite Eight a couple of years ago and make the tournament every year. Uh, although I just said, I, yeah, I, I think, yeah, they're think they're the preseason team that could miss out. But we'll know a lot more. We'll know more about Creighton next week than we will probably any team in the country in terms yeah. of their resume. Uh, Saturday, watch football or go apple picking or do anything <laughs> else with your Saturday because there's nothing good. Sunday, we got some good games. Yeah. Uh, South Carolina, NC State is the highlight. This is the repeat of last year's ally games, right? It was South Carolina, NC State, and then Virginia Tech, Iowa last year too, right? That sounds right. Do they play? Yeah, I think so. Anyway, we'll start with we'll start yeah. with rematch of the Final Four, in which Gamecocks led by one at the half last year in Cleveland, then ran away with it early in the third, went on a run. Good night, see you later. May not get a better matchup of guards this year than Raven Johnson, Sahina Pow Pow, Malaysia Full Wiley. Plus Bree Hall and Tessa Johnson and the 10,000 others against Zoe Brooks, Isaiah James, and Sanai Rivers. This might be one of the best guard matchups of the year. Yeah, I agree. The backcourts on both of these teams are, are super fun. And I mean, we saw that in the final four. You're going to get to see it again on Sunday. I think, assuming Ashley Watkins isn't playing right away, I mean, she might be. The front courts here both are, are going through it at the moment, but the guard matchup is going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, Rivers can't go 2 of 11 like she did in the Final Four. Yeah. Zoe Brooks was 4 of 11. Need to find a way for those two to get more buckets. James was hot in the first half. I think she cooled off, if I recall correctly. Yeah. And then, yeah, I'm with you. Ashton Watkins hasn't done any team activities before, like, two days ago. Um, so I wouldn't expect her to play, or if she does, very few minutes. But still need to hold their own inside for the Wolfpack. Yeah. Cardoso last year was so efficient. 22 points, 10 of 12 shooting. Well, she's gone. Watkins probably isn't there. You still can't match the depth inside, but can you keep the points in the paint and the rebound margin close against Kitts, Fagan, Dowda, Edwards? 
Michigan did. Yeah. So NC State can, and then from that point, it's a matter of can your guards outplay their guards? I lean no to all of that, but not <laughs> by a whole lot. Not not by some overwhelming amount. Yeah, I think this one should be a close one. I think probably South Carolina wins it, but I don't think it's going to be a blowout. I think it, it probably is a close game. Chloe Kitts is really good on Monday. Yeah, She's a very good offensive player. She's, she's good on defense. She's just not – like we're used to when you think South Carolina bigs, you just think these – immovable objects that annihilate everything in their path <laughs> going back to Asia Wilson. And then Leah Boston Cardoso did it. And Watkins does it. Edwards, I think we'll get there. She's played one college game. So, you know, we'll give her some time. Kitts is really an underrated presence in this lineup on the offensive end. Uh, the other game, Iowa, Virginia tech. I don't have a whole lot of thoughts on it. I think Iowa wins this. It was great when it was Caitlin Clark and Georgia Amor and Liz Kitley and, <laughs> and, Kenny Brooks and Lisa Bluter, and well, now it's still you know entertaining game, but we'll see what the Hokies look like under Megan Duffy at least. Yeah, I, I agree. I expect Iowa to win this one, but yeah, it's a, it just doesn't live up to the hype of last year's game. It's hard to say much about it. Yeah, uh, the other good game on Sunday, our first real look at Duke and Maryland. Blue Devils kind of played with their food a little last night. Looked like they were going to blow the brains at Liberty. And then it was a close game at halftime, and then Duke just kind of took care of business in the second half. And then Maryland, we saw them play Coppin State, 10 newcomers. So I just, this is our our first real opportunity to see two teams that we don't know a whole lot about. Yeah, I think this one should be interesting in that, like you said, the teams that these teams have played so far, they don't tell you a whole lot about what these squads really look like. Obviously, they've taken care of business, so that says something. But beyond that, I think this will be a good test for both sides in terms of how are all these new pieces fitting together and, and what does it look like for this year? Yeah, for Duke, can they be better at shooting the three, 32% yeah. last year? Can they turn it over fewer than 17 times a game? Can they find this, the consistency that eluded them last year? They never won more than three conference games in a row last year, which the ACC was decent, wasn't overwhelmingly good last year, so that surprised me when I read that this week. I have no idea what to expect with Maryland. Ten newcomers. I expect depth. I expect rebounding to be strengths. I just will find out if they can score behind Cheyenne Sellers against one of the better defenses they're going to play until Big Ten play. Give me Duke. I just think they're a little, they're, they're more of a known commodity, and I think they'll score enough. Yeah, I, I tend to agree. I feel like Maryland right now, and from what I've seen these first couple of days, like they're just still figuring things out, and it's a lot of new pieces, and Duke feels like the the favorite here. But at the same time, I don't really know what to make of this Maryland team, so they couldn't come out and surprise me. All right. Last week. Two more things before we get out of here. If you're looking for other games next week, Monday, Creighton and Drake. Wednesday, Syracuse plays Maryland. If that floats your boat. Thursday, K-State plays Creighton. Just a lot of Blue Jays in the next week. Otherwise, you can largely take the week off. And then things will heat up once we start getting to MTEs. Uh, last week, we talked 33 different teams, all of whom are expected to, to varying degrees, not only make the NCAA tournament, but do so comfortably, compete for conference, national championships, what have you. Let's go a little more desperate place on the spectrum. I have some names of folks who might be on the hot seat in 24, 25. I have four written down. I'm not sure three of them happen, but they do themselves favors by doing things like winning games you're supposed to. And we'll start with Arkansas, Mike Neighbors, who lost to Fairfield in the opener. Uh, do, do you have any names before I kind of go through my four here? No, I think your four are a good set. I'm struggling to add to that list. Yeah, we'll start Mike Neighbors at Arkansas. I had this written down before Monday when they lost to Fairfield. Shout out to the Stags, by the way. Two losses last year. Off to a one and no start at an SEC school. They know what they're doing. Uh, at his alma water. He went on a wild run to the SEC title game in 2019. Wasn't enough to make the tournament. They were close. They would have easily made it in 2020. They make it in 21 and 22, lost in the first round in both years. That includes a home loss to Wright State in 2021. Made the WNIT the last two years. Their leading scorer transferred out to Leah Scott. Alma mater, he signed through 2028, just doing themselves a lot of favors by winning more games. In his favor, you only have one senior this year. They have five freshmen, they have four sophomores, so they're young. Also in his favor, the school might pay Sam Pittman, the football coach, to go away. That's a lot of money. 
it's the SEC. They can always find money if you want to. But he signed through 2028. That's a big buyout. Uh, Mike Neighbors is one. I'll stay in the SEC. Weird one. Did you see what Missouri lost to in the opener? I did not. They went to Vermont. Decent America East team and lost. I looked. They have a player who's from a senior who prepped in New Hampshire. My educated guess. She's from the Congo originally. My educated guess is that it was a homecoming of sorts because that's the only logical explanation I can see for why Missouri is opening at Vermont. But this is a weird situation. Robin Pinchton's in the final year of her contract. I thought she'd have been let go last year, but they had an interim athletic director. So I don't think, I don't know anything about the situation. If you gave me an interim job for my boss, I would not be given the directive to make multi-million dollar decisions. <laughs> I'd be told to make sure that doesn't burn to the ground until we hire someone else. Uh, Tigers have zero commitments in next year's recruiting class. Her contract expires at the end of the year. So like, it's weird that she's still there because yeah. I feel like you're not going to re-sign her, but you're setting yourself up for a complete dumpster fire next year. Like that's, <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't get, I don't yeah. get it. Uh, Big 10, I have two. Kelly Graves, when the world stopped in 2020, Oregon was on top of the world. Like They were the national title. I think they were the favorites that year. The Sabrina Inescu, they brought in the nation's top-ranked recruiting class the very next year. Well, zero of them were on the roster last year, let alone this year. Like, do you realize how bad Oregon was last year? Yeah, this is just like a fascinating, like, fall to me. Like, they went from, like you said, top team in the country, like, looking on top of the world and it has just tumbled so quickly. <laughs> they were two and 16 in the Pac-12 last year. Really good conference. Hard to win. Hard to lose 14 games in a row. And that's what they did. Their top two scores from last year's team are gone. They've missed the tournament the last two years. A new conference is the pressure on like he signed for five more years. So again, I, I think he gets a pass for last year, but year one of the big 10 there, I don't have them in the middle. Yeah. Like I think they're a step below that giant pack of what Indiana, Michigan, Michigan State, Nebraska, Illinois. I'm missing teams probably in there. It's just I go I can't think of another team that's taken quite as precipitous a fall as quickly. And then yeah, my okay. last one. Yeah, go oh, go ahead. I was gonna say they did add Deja Kelly, so like that was a nice off he was in pickup, but I don't know. You gotta do something with that. Yeah, then my last one is uh, Joe McEwen at Northwestern. He's been there a while since 2008. They were 26-4 and four when COVID came. They made the second round the next year. Since then, they have six combined Big Ten wins the last two years. It's not getting any easier. You picked up, I don't know how often they play USC and UCLA. Those are a couple more losses. So those are just four names that we're talking to the other, you know, we're talking to the, the favorites. Uh we're at a place in women's basketball where, you know, hot seat talk is a thing. I've saw multiple articles this week about it. Um, we will finish up, which I meant to do a few minutes ago, but hey, we'll save the best for last. Mm -hmm. Hot take time. Give me your, for actually, okay, we'll, 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 we'll hit pause. Give me your A10 hot take. Yeah. I'm very intrigued by this. All right. So this is, it's a, a bit of a hot take it's that they could get three teams into the field. I think they get two, but I think the top of the A10 is, is really good this year so if they can especially like Richmond right now like if you look at Richmond's schedule a lot of opportunities to win St. Joe's is going to be good again George Mason is going to be good again you just have a Duquesne team that beat Providence or not Providence Princeton uh, so keep an eye on the, the A-10 I have to get my A-10 friends a shout out okay Duquesne big win over Princeton they have at Penn State they're at Pitt alright you need to win a lot of games for Duquesne. Yeah, Richmond See what they got. They're at Fairfield. That again, that's not going to do anything for the RPI, but right. it's an interesting game in four days. So that's a game. If you're looking for something to watch next week, yeah. Richmond at Fairfield. I assume that's probably ESPN Plus. They play Texas. They play Tennessee. They play Alabama in consecutive games. That's spicy. Yeah. So they have three SEC opportunities, and two of them, you say maybe right now you say are gettable. We'll yeah. see how Tennessee and Alabama play out because I still don't know anything about. Tennessee, they scored a lot of points. I expected them to. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Oklahoma State. And then what was your other team? Uh, St. Joe's. And George Mason, Joe's. too. We have four teams that we're talking yeah. about. This is the good stuff. Uh, George Mason, Maryland. 
Wake Forest, you probably need to win. And then, yeah, okay, I'm in. They weren't that far off last year. Right? No, they they were fringe getting two in last year. I think they get two in this year. I think three is probably a long shot, but I think uh, if some of these teams win these big games, it's a possibility. Any other hot takes? That was my main one. Okay. Um, my other hot take, and this is like, it's not really that hot of a take, but I think we will see like a six seed or lower in the final four this year. It feels like one of those years that's just going to give us some chaos. Oh, I'm not with you there. I'm with you on the A-10. I'm not with you <laughs> uh, mine is that Ohio State wins the Big Ten. Oh, One game, <laughs> I'm in. Don't, I, I just said at the beginning of the show, don't overreact to anything. I'm overreacting to Ohio <laughs> State's big win over Cleveland State. Jelani this... Cambridge, real deal. 30-some-odd points, 10 of 12 shooting, a bunch of rebounds, a bunch of assists. That If, if she can become a Hannah Hidalgo type player where you come in as a freshman and just light the world up and she was the number two recruit or, you know, varying degrees of Sarah Strong, Jelani Cambridge and Joyce Edwards were one, two and three. If she can come in, Cody McMahon is as talented as anyone in the country. If she can just find consistency with it and maybe she doesn't have to be the superstar. If Cambridge is, they have experience. Taylor theory is still somehow there. I feel like she's been there for 50 (laughs) years. That's my hot take. Ohio state. I'm back on the train. They let me down last year, but I'm back on the train. I like it. At least it was like an overreaction to Cleveland State. and That's like a team that we will probably talk about at some point in March. They so. won 29 games last year. Yeah, yeah. No, that was saying. They're like, they're a solid team. We're not talking hot takes off of like beating BU or something like that. Come on. Terriers are, they made the, the Patriot League title game like three of the last four yeah, years. Yeah, but they've, they've had quite the fall off. I think they're only supposed to be like six in the Patriot League this year. During that sentence, they committed three more turnovers. Yeah, <laughs> that was that was rough last night. Well, Megan, what are your weekend plans? Because there's not much basketball. Are you going to be, you're going to be watching Richmond and Fairfield, obviously. Well, that's during the week next week. Unfortunately, I have to travel for the day job. Otherwise I would make it out to Fairfield to get, catch that one. So people in Connecticut, if you're looking for something to do next Wednesday, that one should be great. Um, I am going up to UConn though for UConn USF on Sunday, which is not the most exciting game, but still will be there. Would have been more exciting like two years ago. Yeah. (laughs) Well, Megan, safe travels out to California, and we will talk next week, folks.